This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. From Microbe TV, this is TWIM, This Week in Microbiology, episode number 129, recorded on June 2nd. 2016. This episode is brought to you by Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers over 1,400 documentaries and nonfiction series from the world's best filmmakers. Get unlimited access starting at just $2.99 a month. And for our audience, the first two months are completely free if you sign up at curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the promo code microbe. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Michelle Swanson. Hello. How's everything out there? It must be quiet now. All the undergrads are gone, right? It's a little quiet. Yeah, we still have a lot of graduate students around. Of course. And it's beautiful weather. Beautiful. Life is Mid-70s, good. Mid-70s, sunny and, and you can golf outside now, right? Yeah, I've been golfing. Do you have a lot of golf courses or just one there? On? Well, I, I'm i a member at a course, and so mm-hmm. I typically play there. But yeah, we have lots of golf courses Wonderful. in Michigan. Also joining us from Charleston, South Carolina, Michael Schmidt. Hello, everyone. Last time we spoke, you had a t-shirt on. I did. I was out finishing off of a meeting. <laughs> Probably now you're in a shirt and tie, right? No tie. No tie. It's short sleeve. Once once it crosses uh, Memorial Day, the, the ties go in the closet until fall. Now, you're at a medical center, right? Right. So you don't notice when people graduate, probably. We actually do. We, we have graduation in the horseshoe, uh, and it's actually quite nice. And it was actually two weeks ago, and everybody processes up. And unlike most people who get their terminal degrees, a lot of the folks here actually do indeed come back for their graduations. Even the PhD students come back Mm -hmm. and they down the cap and gown and it's it's a big thing. So there's no undergraduates there, just a medical school, right? We do have undergraduates, but they're not undergraduates in the traditional sense. They're getting specialty type degrees. Are they they affiliated with another institution nearby or are they No, they generally finish their first two years off campus, and then they come here and finish their clinical rotations. Uh, These Mm -hmm. are folks in extracorporeal therapy. We used to have a program in medical technology. Right. So things along those lines where the baccalaureate degree is all they need in order to get into clinical practice. Got it. All right. Well, pretty soon we'll all be at ASM Microbe. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Should be fun. Yeah. In this year, of course, two meetings combined, so it's going to be bigger, right? Busier. It's going to be busier. And the Boston Convention Center is one where you need your track shoes to run between sessions because of that wide chasm between the two meeting sides. Yep. But it's a great opportunity for the basic scientists to, to um, interact and benefit from the clinical microbiology side. For sure. Are you, are you going to hear Bill Gates on Thursday night? Of course. Yeah. How about you, Michael? I'm really interested to hear what he has to share with us on his perspective of microbiology and infectious disease. We know he's a longtime supporter of polio eradication, one of your mm-hmm. hobbies. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's very much interested in uh, under-resourced nations and the infectious diseases that are plaguing those countries. So I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Yeah, it should be interesting. I never, I've not heard ever a billionaire speak, so I might as well go, right? That's right. <laughs> you haven't been to a Trump rally yet? <laughs> no, I haven't. I'm sorry. I have not. I don't plan on going to one. <laughs> not intentionally. No. Is he a billionaire? I guess so. We, we don't know. He hasn't released his tax records. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, Michael, you, uh, as you I know, have snippet today. you have a snippet. Apparently, antibiotic resistance is in the news again, big time. Tell us about it. 
Well, the snippet today is a manuscript that was released early on the 26th of May with quite some fanfare. Many of you probably saw it, as I did last Saturday, splashed on the front page of our newspaper. And the title of this paper is Escherichia coli harboring MCR1 and BLACTXM on a novel ink F plasmid, first report of MCR1 in the United States. And the paper was authored by a group entitled the Multidrug Resistant Organism Repository Surveillance Network of the Walter Reed Institute of Research in Silver Spring, Maryland. And the authors were McGann, Snuzrud, Maybank, Corey, Ong, Clifford, Hinkle, Whitman, Lesho, and Shecker. And what you most likely heard in the paper is the colistin resistance in the USA or the topic sentence of their particular paper was MCR1 heralds the emergence of a truly pan-drug resistant bacterium. So here's the story. Starting in May of 2016, all extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing E. coli isolates that are submitted to the clinical micro lab at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center will be assessed for resistance to colistin by the E-test. And so in the first of the six samples that they screened by the E-test, and I'll explain what all these magic acronyms mean here in a few minutes, is they found one out of the six of the organisms that they routinely tested was resistant to colistin. And this was the first time that we have seen this particular resistance profile on a plasmid in an enterobacteriaceae bacteriaceae with the plasmid MCR1 in the United States, leading many epidemiologists, especially the top one in the country, Tom Frieden of the CDC, to make statements that the association between MCR1, the plasmid that this microbe had, and INCF, which is another plasmid it had, are vehicles for dissemination of antibiotic resistance and virulence genes amongst the Enterobacteriaceae. So in order to learn why this story made such a splash in the news media in the United States, you need to know some background. And this all starts in February of 2016 with the publication in a journal called The Lancet Infectious Diseases, where a group from China alerted us to the emergence of a plasmid-mediated colistin resistance mechanism called MCR1 in animals and humans in China, a microbiological and a molecular biology study. And it was a large group out of China for the sake of time, since it's only a snippet, I won't read all of her names. But suffice it to say, until now, colistin, which is in the family of polymyxin antibiotics, resistance to it had been associated only with chromosomal mutations. And it's never been reported up until this group in China released it via horizontal gene transfer. And then the group in China learned and reported that during a routine surveillance project on antimicrobial resistant in commensal E. coli from food animals, so chickens, pigs, cows, a major increase of colistin resistance was observed. And they found that this colistin resistance was mediated by a plasmid. And the particular strain of E. coli that they looked at was SHP45. And they were able to demonstrate that this resistance could be transferred horizontally to another strain. And this microbe was isolated from a pig. And they conducted further analysis of this possible plasmid-mediated polymyxin resistance. And they described this first emergence on a plasmid-mediated vehicle to confer resistance in the Enterobacteriaceae. And, and, and Michael, could, could I interject that it's sure. not a, that the fact that they were looking in food animals is relevant because it's common practice in agriculture to add antibiotics to, as a, to prevent disease, but also to promote growth. So heavy use of antimicrobials in the food industry increases the likelihood of antibiotic-resistant microbes in the food animals. In addition, I don't know if Michelle's going to go into this as well, but colistin 
doesn't have great bioavailability in people. It's one of these drugs you take and it literally just passes through you unmodified. It, it doesn't penetrate very well because it's in the polymyxin class of antibiotics. Many of us have been exposed to polymyxin antibiotics because they're in the common over-the-counter antibiotic ointments that we use to put on little skin scrapes for our kids. You know, we've all seen the bacitracin, polymyxin B, and nystatin antibiotics that you can buy at the drugstore for a couple of bucks to place on little skin scrapes to prevent them from being infected. And so what colistin is principally used for now is in a nebulized form because colistin also has the ability to disrupt biofilms and it's also used to displace the microbiome. So colistin's used to, I guess, prep people for stool transplants, if you will, because it moves microbes out. And the mechanism of action of colistin is it effectively interacts with lipopolysaccharides and phospholipids in the outer membrane of gram negatives. And you can see it's a membrane active type antibiotic. So it's big news that it became resistant on a plasmid because beforehand, what happened is you had a chromosomal alteration that altered an outer membrane protein and it did magical things in order to prevent colistin from binding to the LPS. So that's what got all of this fuss started. And if you look in the Lancet papers, there was an op-ed that was written in Lancet at the time that this paper was released in February as well as a number of other reports from other workers in the field talking about colistin resistance being present in the human microbiome in uh, humans that they were characterizing. And there's a whole family of papers that were released in February. So now that's what was not commonly reported in the news media is the tie-in to this big splash that happened in Lancet ID, which is more of a global journal than what happened in the United States. And so the authors of this particular paper that appeared in Antimicrobial Agents in Chemotherapy, which is an ASM journal, and since the federal government is the author or controls the copyright, this will be in the public domain as an open access article. The authors of this paper reported that in responding to the threat of MCR1, starting in May of 2016, all extended spectrum beta-lactamase producing E. coli clinical isolates that are submitted to the clinical lab at Walter Reed National Military Med Center will be assessed for resistance to colistin by this e-test. So this all starts on May 1st, and clinical laboratories are constantly asking a simple question, what's new in relation to antibiotic resistance in their population? And if you think about it, the Walter Reed National Military Medical Center sees patients from all over the globe. And so by virtue of the fact that they saw this with such fanfare emerging in Lancet ID, they began this proactive way of asking the question, has the risk actually come into their patient population? So the strain in question that is being worked up in the manuscript, it resulted from the isolation of E. coli from a urine sample of a 49-year-old female who presents to an outpatient clinic in Pennsylvania with normal symptoms suggestive of a urinary tract infection. And she presented on the 26th of April. So it's only June 2nd today when we're recording this. And so they've done all of this work and published the paper in less time than it actually took for that woman to, you know, less than one month. She got seen on the 26th and this paper was released on May 26th. <laughs> so this is really pretty rapid response. So the isolate was sent to Walter Reed because it's the reference lab. She was seen in an outpatient setting because about 150 million people 
will develop a urinary tract infection each year. And they are more common in women than men. And up to 10% of women will have a UTI in a given year. And about one in two women will at least have one urinary tract infection at some point in their lives. So simply put, urinary tract infections are a common occurrence. And Vincent and I did um, a twim at an ASM where we had uh, someone who spends his entire life worrying about urinary tract infections and the E. coli associated with it. And that was Dr. Johnson from Minnesota. So we heard all of the backstory on UTIs and E. coli. So I'll refer you to that particular episode to hear Dr. Johnson talk about uh, urinary tract infections. And so this is a fairly straightforward paper. They have the isolate and they plant it on a Petri plate and the e-test, and I've taken the liberty of grabbing a public domain picture of an e-test. And what you do for an e-test is you paint bacteria onto a Petri plate and then you drop an antibiotic impregnated strip onto the plate. And many of us in early days of microbiology would put antibiotics on paper discs and the antibiotic would diffuse out and you would see this beautiful clear zone where bacteria weren't able to grow because of the concentration of antibiotic. Well, the e-test is a more sophisticated variation of this. And what they have done is they have deposited a specific concentration of the antibiotic into the paper strip and then printed numbers on it that confer the minimum inhibitory concentration. So where you see the zone of clearing, there's a number printed on the little strip, and you can actually determine the MIC for that particular organism. So it makes it quantitative, whereas the old version of the Kirby-Bauer test wasn't quantitative unless you actually pulled out your ruler and measured it and then you had to do a supplemental test in order to truly figure out the MIC or the minimum inhibitory concentration. So they did the e-test and then they screened this particular isolate from this woman and it was MRN, SN and 388634 was the strain ID number. And they tested it against 20 common antibiotics that are used routinely to treat urinary tract infections. And this isolate was resistant to 14 of the 20 antibiotics that they tested, or 70% of the antibiotics that they screened it against, it was effectively resistant to. So this is big news. This woman had uh, E. coli that was resistant to many of the first-line drugs that are used for treating UTIs, but fortunately for this individual, it was sensitive to nitrofurotonin, which is a drug of choice for a UTI, as well as it was still sensitive to the carbapenemase class of antibiotics. So that is the good news. The bad news is it was resistant to 70% of the other ones, and you can take a look at that table and determine the sensitivity or resistance to particular antibiotics. When I was hunting to figure out whether or not something was sensitive or resistant, I stumbled into a resource that's on the European site equating MICs and sensitivity and resistance. So you just put in the class of organism that you're looking for and the antibiotic, and it will actually give you sensitive resistance and the MIC just by doing it pretty quickly. So I put that in my notes to link so you can play the game. The United States uses another standard called the CLSI standard, and they unfortunately don't have a handy dandy website like the Europeans that I was able to discover uh, when I was preparing for this talk. So the strain that, that was associated with this woman's UTI belonged to sequence type 457, which didn't mean much to me until I went out and read some more about it. 
And sequence type 457 is a rare type of E. coli that was identified in 2008 from a urine culture from an individual in the United Kingdom. And then it was again reported on in Italy where it was found now to harbor the carbapenemase cluster of gene resistance. Whereas this woman's particular uh, strain did not have the carbapenemase resistance trait. So then they worked up the plasmids that were associated with this particular strain. They found that there were two, and fortunately they were both low copy number plasmids. And here, copy number recall does matter because large copy number plasmids will actually produce more gene product. And of course, if you're making a diffusible uh, compound like the beta lactamase, it'll diffuse into the medium and inactivate the drug before it even comes in contact with the site of the infection or the infection because it's a diffusible product. And the plasmids were quite large. The first one was 225 kilobases. And many of us who are practicing in the art of molecular biology know about incompatibility groups when we try to put two plasmids in. One gets bumped out if they're of the same compatibility group because they can't coexist to one another. So this one had two plasmids. One was an F18AB1 and the other was this Inc H112 plasmid that was described by Lou in their seminal paper of February about the MCR. So this ink plasmid was in this particular woman's strain here in the United States. They then, the authors at Walter Reed then did the extra step of sequencing it and actually comparing it to the sequences that were published by Lou. And here they found that the gene was in a different orientation and a different location in this 89 KB insert in this Inc. H12 plasmid. And so that's suggesting that things have moved about. So this plasmid is already global in nature. And so, you know, the five points that the authors drive home in the report is to the, the best of their knowledge, this is the first report of MCR1 in the United States. And as Elio often says, stay tuned because I think this is the first report out of Walter Reed, uh, but I think now a number of clinical labs are going to begin to look for it, and so we may see many more reports. The epidemiology of this particular isolate, isolated from a clinic in Pennsylvania, and the patient reported no travel history for the past five months. So that means she probably picked it up locally or from some food that she ate and we know our food supply is now global, so it could have come in from overseas or it's now everywhere in the United States. So that's why I say stay tuned. And to date, as the authors were putting this paper to bed, they tested a further 20 extended spectrum beta lactamase producing E. coli from patients at Walter Reed. And they have all tested negative for MCR1. So one out of the 20 they've tested so far has been positive, but the other 19 were colistin sensitive. But I think the final two points that they make in this manuscript, the association between MCR1 and this Inc. F plasmid is really very concerning because they are indeed vehicles for dissemination of antibiotic resistance in virulence genes amongst the Enterobacteriaceae. Just to emphasize that, not only spreading within E. coli, but also spreading to Klebsiella and Pseudomonas, two other gram-negative species that can cause significant problems clinically. And so um, this is their fifth and final or their take-home point. Surveillance is critical. And I was asked to comment about this as well as uh, the chief of our infectious disease. And my comment is, very similar to what uh, Shecker and his colleagues mentioned, is surveillance is critical. We are fortunate that we have labs that are curious and have the budget to ask the question, what's new, for they're serving us well, because you, know, you don't want to give a patient uh, 
when you prescribe empiric therapy, a drug that the organism is likely going to be resistant to. And so my colleague, Cassie Salgado, who's chief of ID, in her remarks to our local paper, basically said three points, that the way most hospitals in the United States protect against the emergence of these multi-drug resistant organisms. First and foremost, they take steps to reduce the risk of emergence of this resistant organism, and they do this by antibiotic stewardship. And they hospitals monitor the use of antibiotics and they help the clinicians choose the antibiotic that will best treat the infection for that particular microbe. And they strictly follow the Clinical and Laboratory Standards Institute, or CLSI, guidelines for the concentration and length of time that you prescribe the drug for that patient. So antibiotic stewardship is the number one line of defense. The second is what we're seeing here in the literature that Lancet Lancet ID published and now AAC published, is we have to understand the epidemiology of the organism amongst our patient populations in order to prevent transmission. The fact that this woman in Pennsylvania at an outpatient clinic presented with a UTI infection with no travel history is of significance. And so routinely hospitals have infection prevention and control programs that do indeed conduct this type of surveillance. And then finally, ensure compliance with environmental cleaning and disinfection so you can prevent the organisms from exchanging the information horizontally amongst themselves on solid surfaces in the built environment of the hospital. So one of the things that we're doing is, in addition to my pitch for copper, there's also ultraviolet light, there's enhanced cleaning, and there's contact precautions, and all of these other things. So this is a, a really exciting paper that is, I think the call to arms was really going to encourage um, hospital infection control programs and clinical laboratories to begin to monitor for this so that we can help our clinicians use the right drugs so we can limit the emergency of these pan-drug resistant microbes. Michael, this was uh, widely reported in the press as superbug. Why is that? Because it has so many genes. This, this one particular isolate from this woman had 50 different antibiotic resistance genes, Mm -hmm. 15 different mechanisms to combat different antibiotics. Now, Elio, in his comments to me last week when I suggested this paper, he said, isn't this old news? We know plasmids move. (laughs) And, and, And so I guess the real question that Elio was challenging me with, why does a microbe hold on to so many genes that seemingly don't serve any purpose to it Mm. other than get rid of antibiotics because they they really don't confer any fitness. And I guess the answer to that question is because antibiotics are so widely used in everything from our food supply to treating infections that don't require antibiotics like the common cold. So you'd argue that they're there because we are applying the pressure to keep them there. Yeah, it's it's pure selection pressure, I think. Michelle, what is your take? Um, I agree, it's selection pressure. But and, and you emphasize that we do have measures that individual hospitals can take. But I think this paper, this biology, emphasizes this is really a global public policy issue because we need to work with our fellow man all over the world um, because farming practices in Southeast Asia, for example, are going to affect what we see here clinically because flu is not the only thing that migrates out of, out of Southeast Asia um, and, and makes it to our country. So I think a number of, of reports have come out recently from the Wellcome Trust, from the Pew Charitable Trust, from the White House, all saying that we need to come together, not only in this country, but globally to put in measures to reduce the risk of antibiotic resistance. So we need public health education. We need clean water and sanitation so that um, bugs that get into the soil then don't end up in our food supply. Surveillance, as you pointed out, 
better diagnostics, vaccine, and of course, um, new antibiotics. Yeah, that goes without saying. And I think that's what Dr. Friedman of the CDC was really calling to arms as he says, the medicine cabinet is empty. <laughs> now is now is the time to begin to look for new antimicrobials. And uh, one final note is the senior author on this paper, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Kurt Shecker, is a former student of the Medical University of South Carolina. To give you some background on Kurt, he obtained his PhD in, in immunology, working in a lab that was looking at neuroimmunology, specifically MS and uh, spinal cord injury and the reactive immunology associated with that. And Kurt enlisted in the U.S. Army to do a postdoc in malaria vaccine development back in 2001. And then, of course, the anthrax issues, as well as the Gulf War, sent him down a different career path. And prior to his joining the Walter Reed Institute of Research in Maryland, he was at USAMRID. And two years ago, he was the individual who set up the molecular diagnostic labs for the U.S. Army in Africa for Ebola. Mm. So uh, he is now a card-carrying Division C member for um, looking at all these all these issues. So I was up at um, Uniform Health Services at the end of April before this study started and actually visited Kurt in his laboratory at Walter Reed. So I actually got to see um, the workflow of how specimens come in from all across the clinics at the Walter Reed Medical Complex as well as the outpatient clinics and saw how they got processed and everything. So it, it was really good to see Kurt again. I haven't seen him. I guess I saw him last year at ASM when he talked about his experiences with Ebola, but now he's got this experience with this uh, MCR1 plasmid. And he sent me a cute email last week. He says, yep, that was me that made all the news. <laughs> and, and And so... It's it's always good to see your former students do well. Yeah, very good. Do you think that there'll be a late breaking opportunity at ASM Microbe to hear about this? I I would imagine so. I think um, based on what's happened in China, and I, I think the stop the presses news is colistin resistance moved from the chromosome to a plasmid. Yeah. Yep. All right. Thank you, Michael. And I'll, I'll just add that I have also added to the show notes two links to two blogs by the ASM CEO, uh, Stefano Bartuzzi, who has written about the role of ASM and other nonprofit agencies in bringing together experts, not only from academia, but from government agencies, professional societies, industries, to work together on uh, strategies to reduce the risk of antibiotic-resistant infections. All right. Thank you, Michelle. All right. We have a paper for you published in Cell Host Microbe entitled Intracellular Action of a Secreted Peptide Required for Fungal Virulence. I'm developing a fondness for the fungi, and I've done a number of papers on fungi in the last year or so. I think Helio's rubbed off on you. I do like fungi. They're very interesting. Uh, and this one is uh, out of a number of groups, um, the main People are at UCSF, University of California, San Francisco, but there are also contributions from University of Minnesota, Scripps Research Institute, Duke University, Washington University, and the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard. First author is Christina Homer, and um, the last author is Hitten Madani, who I've heard talk before about fungi. And this is quite a tour de force paper. There are so many experiments and so detailed. It's really as I was reading it, I was just stunned. By it could how. be four or five individual papers. It's amazing. There's so yeah. much stuff here. So this is all about cryptococcus, which is a fungus uh, that causes the disease cryptococcosis. There are over 30 different species of cryptococcus, but two of them, which are called cryptococcus neoformans and cryptococcus gadi, cause almost all the cryptococcal infections in humans and animals. Cryptococcus neoformans is the most common cause of fungal meningitis, which is a leading cause of death in people 
who have HIV and AIDS in sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, it accounts for 40% of AIDS-related mortality, quite a big number. There are a million cases a year globally with 600,000 deaths. These are organisms found in soil throughout the world, and you can become infected after inhaling spores that are produced by the fungi. Uh, this can come from dirt or even in pigeon dwellings, which harbor the fungus. And sometimes these cause a lung infection, but other times there are no symptoms whatsoever. Typically, people with uh, immunocompromised situations, weakened immune systems, uh, the fungus goes from the lungs to other parts of the body, including the central nervous system, causes serious disease. Uh, but sometimes healthy people get sick as well. Now, the authors of this paper are interested in what regulates the virulence of Cryptococcus neoformans. And as a little background, because this is where the paper is heading, quorum sensing is a process among bacteria that are, is needed for communication, and quorum sensing systems are often needed for virulence. And the classical example of quorum sensing, the bacteria secrete a compound, and surrounding bacteria monitor its, comp its concentration to sense the cell number. And quorum sensing is used to regulate a whole host of different biological functions. Among gram-negative bacteria, the quorum sensing molecule is often what's a chemical known as acyl homoserine lactones, and in gram-negatives can be peptides. But quorum sensing systems, uh, like those in bacteria, haven't been identified in eukaryotes. And in Cryptococcus, there happens to be a candidate previously uh, identified it's called QSP1, which stands for quorum sensing peptide 1. It's a short peptide discovered because it allows the fungal cells to grow uh, in culture when a, a gene called TUP1 is deleted. These have the phenotype that at low density, the cells don't grow unless you add the peptide. And you add the peptide, they can grow in the presence of this mutation. And so this peptide was purified from culture supernatants, and so it's a candidate or a quorum sensing peptide, and that's why they called it QSP1. And so that's what they're working on in this in this very <laughs> ambitious paper. So it turns out that uh, the gene that encodes this peptide QSP1 is regulated by three different transcriptional networks. All right, I'm going to tell you the names. They're not going to mean a lot to you, but they're going to come back later. They're called GAT201, GAT204, and LIV3. And all three of these transcriptional networks, in other words, these are uh, gene regulatory networks where uh, transcriptional proteins regulators are, are involved in uh, regulating the production of mRNAs. And all three of these are involved in virulence in mice. Um, and QSP1 is turns out to be the most abundant mRNA produced in cells grown in culture, cryptococcus neoformin cells. And the messenger RNA encodes a precursor of a 24 amino acid protein that has a signal peptide on it, which suggests that it could be secreted. And this is cleaved to an 11, 11 amino acid final product, which is the QSP1 uh, peptide. So it's only 11 amino acids long. And again, this, this peptide is secreted into the supernatant of yeast cells grown in culture, and it's produced in micromolar levels. And the more dense uh, the cells get, the higher concentration. All right, so in this paper, when they delete the QSP1 gene, there's no effect on growth. In cell culture, the, the fungi continue to grow properly, but in an, a mouse model for virulence where they inoculate the fungus intranasally and the mice die, the cells lacking this gene grow poorly, but they don't have any reduced growth ability when they're assayed in a different animal model, which is an injection into the central nervous system of rabbits. So they have an initial problem in the lung of mice, but apparently the tar one of the target organs, which is the CNS, there's no problem there. Uh, infection with uh, this mutant, again, the deletion of this QSP1 gene, leads to an immune response, which is called the Th2 immune response. This is an immune response characterized by cytokine productions that are generally involved in the production of antibodies. And among fungi in general, it's not antibodies that clear infections, but rather cellular responses, which would be a Th1 cytokine response. So somehow not having the gene for this QSP1 is skewing the immune response to the wrong kind of response, and therefore um, clearance isn't achieved. Now, one of the things they notice, and which you see throughout this paper, is that the colonies of 
of yeast of cryptococcus lacking QSP1 are dried and wrinkled at room temperature. Very and as a geneticist, you love to see that. It's a great. You love to see something on a plate because it's so much easier than putting fungi up the nose of a mouse. That's right, or any other biochemical assay that you would do. Right, you can look at it, and uh, this is compared to the wild type yeast, which have a smooth mucoid appearance. And so, as Michelle says, they can use this to figure out how QSP one works, and they use this throughout the paper. Uh, and there are lots and lots of photographs of smooth. And dried and wrinkled uh, colony. But it's cheap. It's quick. It is. It's, it's great. It's fabulous. You know, back in the days when we didn't have sequencing and all sorts of things, this is how we did our work, right? Yeah. Absolutely. I was a yeast geneticist as a, as a PhD student, so yep. I, I loved these phenotypes. You appreciate this, right? Mm. Yeah. And for example, if you take a patch of mutant cells on a plate and you grow it next to a patch of wild type cells, the mutant cells are smooth and mucoid because they think... This is because the peptide is produced by the wild type cells and the mutant cells don't have the gene, so they can't. It diffuses across to the patch of mutant cells and uh, it complements them. And they actually can show that by adding the peptide to these patches of mutant cells, it makes them grow in the, in the wild type morphology. And if they make peptides that are altered, they have different amino acids in throughout them, uh, they don't work. So it's a really nice assay for the activity of QSP1. Okay, so moving on now, what is QSP1 doing? It's known that secreted proteases are important for central nervous system invasion by these cryptococcus uh, fungi. And so these are secreted. You, you can easily assay these in, in culture. If you're growing these fungi in liquid culture, you can find them in the supernatant. And in wild-type culture supernatants, you see mostly what we call metalloproteases and serine endoproteases. Uh, that are secreted from the cells. When you grow the fungi in minimal media, that changes. You get se secreted aspartyl endoproteases. And then these mute, if you look at the mutants which lack the QSP1 uh, gene, QSP1 mutants, they have decreased secreted proteases in minimal media and increased serine proteases and metalloproteases compared to wild type. So there's a, an effect of deleting this putative quorum sensing peptide on the secretion of these proteases, which again are important for, for virulence. Now, if you simply add back peptide to these cultures that have these aberrant protease secretion patterns, it restores the right activity. So this peptide is really important for uh, telling the cells which proteases they should be secreting. They also look at all the RNAs that are made uh, by these various cells. They do what we call RNA-seq, you extract RNA. Uh, from total cells and sequence all of the RNA that's being produced, one of the cool things we can do uh, these days. And this shows that this gene encoding QSP1 regulates genes that encode proteins of the cell wall, the proteins that are present in the extracellular parts of the cells, and genes that are involved in the actual biogenesis of, of the cell wall or its regulation. So somehow QPS1 is regulating all of these genes that are important for building the right uh, outer cell wall. So if you look at cells that lack the QPS1 gene, their cell wall is different from wild type. It's thinner and it's more sensitive to perturbance of the cell wall. And I thought it was really interesting <laughs> that among the, the chemicals they use to perturb uh, the cells and show that the cell wall is different is not only SDS, a detergent, but caffeine. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Makes you want to stay off the caffeine, right? <laughs> So, in other words, a wild-type cell is not very sensitive to SDS or caffeine, but cells lacking QSP1, they have an altered cell wall that's thinner, and they're more sensitive to SDS and caffeine. And again, the cool thing is you can add the peptide to these cells, and the cell wall becomes normal, and it becomes more resistant to these perturbants. So it's interesting that these, this little peptide has all these effects. It has effects on proteases, and it has effects on the actual cell wall. Uh, composition. Now, going back to these transcription factors that I mentioned earlier, remember there were three transcriptional networks that all target QSP1. So one of them, LIV3. Most of the mRNAs that are regulated by QSP1, remember some of these proteases, the cell wall components, and so forth. These are targets of the transcription protein at LIV3. So they said, let's make a double mutant. We'll make a LIV3 mutant. 
a deletion along with the QSP1 mutant. And by looking at the transcriptional uh, program of this double mutant, they could show that 66% of the genes that are regulated or that respond to QSP1 are in fact regulated by this single transcription factor, LIV3. So in other words, LIV3 is is needed for the production of genes that are uh, regulated by QSP1. So as you might predict, because these two are linked, the cells that lack LIV3, they made a LIV3 deletion mutant, also has a dry wrinkled phenotype. Again, it's important for the genes that are regulated by QSP1. And we know that the absence of QSP1 makes a dry wrinkled phenotype. Now, when you delete LIV3, you get dry colony phenotype. You can't complement it by having a wild type colony nearby or by adding peptide, right? Because the peptide doesn't help you because you also need LIV3 to turn on those genes that are uh, regulated by the peptide. So this shows you basically that LIV3 is downstream of QSP1. So QSP1 is doing something, maybe turning on LIV3, and then LIV3 turns on all the genes that are needed for cell wall synthesis and, and, and proteases and so forth. So that's a really nice... I'm doing summaries of these experiments, but in fact, there's hundreds and hundreds of things going on here that uh, are really... That's why this makes this a tour, tour de force of a paper. Mm. So that then uh, coming towards the end, they want to identify um, genes in this pathway of QSP1. So we already, as I said before, these three transcriptional networks regulated by GAT201, 204, and LIV3, and there are over a thousand genes that are targets of these three transcription factors. They actually made deletions of almost all of them. I just, I was amazed by that. <laughs> I don't know if that's, was that a community resource or they, in their lab, did it? It it wasn't clear. It might be, right? And um, this may be a collection that they have, right? Mm -hmm. But it wasn't clear at all. But, you know, they, they, each one of them, they deleted. And um, And then somebody had to assay each of those. Well, of course, as you mentioned, it's just a dry colony phenotype, right? So that's nice. They didn't have to do Mm -hmm. any biochemistry. It's still a lot of plates. It is. It, It is a lot of plates. Um, and they find a number of genes that produce this phenotype. One of them encodes a secreted serine protease. So they follow that up, and it turns out it's the protease that you need to cleave the precursor of QSP1 from 24 to 11 amino acids. All right? Isn't that cool? So, of course, that would be a dry phenotype because you're not cleaving the, the protein to its mature peptide. And this is a cool protease it's not only secreted, but it seems most of it seems to be attached to the outside of the yeast cell, mm-hmm. right? So this uh, QSP1 is secreted in its precursor form, and then it passes by this protease and it's clipped, and then you have the mature 11 amino acid peptide, which is biologically active. Or that protease can clip QSP made by an adjacent cell. That's right. And then take it up. That's right. And respond. Yeah, and then speaking of taking up, another gene that they found in this assay where they deleted all these, this over 1,000 genes, which gives a dry colony phenotype, it encodes a predicted oligopeptide transporter, which is called OPT1. And this again, deletion of this gene gives you a dry colony phenotype. Uh, it's, and that's similar to the phenotype of the QSP1 mutant. So again, you, can't, you cannot c- complement this phenotype by adding... Uh, the peptide. These cells actually make the peptide because they're only deleted in OPT1. It's in the cell supernatant, but apparently and their idea is that this transporter is needed to get the peptide into cells so that they can respond to it. And in this mutant, they can't respond, so they meet, they remain dry and, and wrinkled. <laughs> and as a bacteriologist, I was amazed that the transporter is encoded adjacent to That's the right, yeah. peptide. So even though they found it by presumably screening those 700 mutants. Um, they could have just It was sitting next right door. next door. <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. So the two go hand in hand. So that may, you know, evolutionarily, I guess that makes right. sense. And maybe it moves around that way too. Um, so they actually test um, the idea that OPT1 is a transporter. They, they do a cool experiment where they replace the QSP1 gene, that's the peptide, right, with a, a fusion peptide inclu- encoding a ubiquitin peptide fusion protein. And this protein is not secreted 
it's retained in the cell and, and uh, the cells have uh, ubiquitinases, which will cleave off the ubiquitin part. And these cells have a smooth colony phenotype. When they turn off this gene, they've put it under an inducible promoter. The cells become, have this dry colony phenotype. So again, this is retaining the peptide intracellularly. If it's made, the cells have a smooth phenotype. If it's off, it's dry. So this supports their idea that you know, the peptide, which is normally secreted, has to get into another cell in order to induce the right growth program so that the colonies have this, this phenotype. I thought that was a lovely experiment. It's really nice, yeah. Yeah. So basically, you have a peptide-based cell signaling system that you need for virulence of cryptococcus. The peptide's made, of course, in the cytoplasm. It's exported. Uh, it's proteolized extracellularly, and then it gets into another cell uh, through this transporter, and there it, it, it acts to uh, turn on all these genes uh, that are needed for, besides cell wall synthesis, probably other things as well. And they say this is an unprecedented uh, system in eukaryotes. So this is basically a, a quorum sensing system, which uh, hasn't been discovered before. And so what it means is an individual cell must not benefit from having the um, capsule or the cell wall or the proteases made. They need lots of neighbors around mm -hmm. before it is worthwhile. Yeah. To go into the expense to making it as a community. Right. Apparently one fungal cell it can't make enough to have its desired effect on the host right. or the environment. So they need neighbors to contribute. Right. So as the colony increases in number, you make more and more of this peptide. It has more and more right. effects. Yeah. Again, the peptide appears to regulate the cell wall, but how it does that, they don't know, but I'm sure they're working on that too because that would be really interesting to sort out. Uh, the last point I want to make is that the, they, they mentioned that they think this uh, set of genes encoding this peptide arose by convergent evolution in, in gram-positive bacteria. They use peptides as well for quorum sensing. Yeah, they're, they're imported by channels as well. And in some cases, there are cell wall-associated proteases that are cleaving the precursors. But all these components are not related to any of the components in, in Cryptococcus. They're totally different proteins. So they say they must have evolved independently. So this is a, obviously a powerful system, you know, if it comes up independently in, in fungi versus bacteria. Because there's no, they're not, they don't have a common ancestor, basically. Right. And, and if I may make a plug, yeah. um, there are... Six supplemental figures mm -hmm. that are as rich as the figures associated with the main body of the And we're paper. talking like six, eight, ten panels each oh, yeah. in each it, of these figures. If you really want to be intimidated by one publication, this is it. <laughs> it's incredible the amount of work that this group has put into telling their story. But it is convincing evidence that there is quorum sensing and it is responsible for what the title intends yeah. as it says. I think so, yeah. Yeah. The first author, Christina Homer, is actually an MD-PhD student at UCSF. So she got her PhD recently in the Department of Biochemistry and Biophysics, and now she has returned to the wards for her um, final two years of clinical training. She did publish one other paper um, in the lab. She contributed to as a second author on a cell paper about um, histone modifications uh, affecting gene expression in the same yeast. And because Christina is so busy learning mm -hmm. the clinical trade, we were not able to speak, but I learned that by just doing a little searching and corresponding with her thesis advisor. Mm. That's good. Yep. Well, that firsthand experience with a important fungal pathogen. Right. Nothing like that to, to help you understand <laughs> what you have to deal with. Thank you, Michelle. Yep. Uh, this episode is sponsored by Curiosity Stream, the world's first ad-free nonfiction streaming service with over 1,400 titles and 600 hours of content. It was founded by John Hendricks of Discovery Communications. So you're guaranteed access to real science shows, not reality TV shows that currently plague cable TV. You can get it on many platforms like the web, Roku, Android, iOS, Apple TV, Chromecast, Amazon. You can get it in 196 countries, and they have a wide variety of science, technology, nature, history, interviews, lectures. Again, all nonfiction content. For example, Stephen Hawking's Universe. They have uh, videos on 
viruses and microbes, a series called Life on Us, exploring biodiversity on our bodies, Secret Life Underground, the world of organisms that populate the underground world. So I think a lot of our listeners might enjoy this. And to make it easier for you to sample it, we have monthly and annual plans available starting at $2.99 a month, less than the cost of a cup of coffee or one title on competing on-demand platforms. But you know, as we heard today, you should probably stay away from caffeine. Save your money. Enrich your life and continue learning with one of the largest 4K libraries on the internet. Check out curiositystream.com slash microbe. Use the promo code microbe during sign up to get unlimited access to the world's top documentaries and nonfiction series completely free for the first 60 days. That's two entire months free of one of the largest 4K libraries around. Just go to curiositystream.com slash microbe and use the offer code microbe at startup. We do have a few email for you. Uh, first one is from Stephen, who writes, Congratulations for keeping up such a wide variety of thought-provoking podcasts and maintaining such a tremendous output. I find they all leave me with more questions than answers, which I think is a sign of good science. On the latest TWIM, I listened with fascination to Elio's roundup of species able to manage without mitochondria. I wonder, will Wolbachia ever be reduced to the status of organelle? <laughs> it's, we have asked that before. <laughs> but then I found myself feeling decidedly uneasy as I listened to the review of the paper on using a phage lysate as a novel antibiotic against bacteria. Our traditional approach to antibiotics and indeed anti-cancer drugs and pesticides through simply prospecting for active chemicals in the environment and then using them in a haphazard way, both through the profit motive and misuse, has in every case led to the development of resistance and the danger of a return to morbidity to pathogens long thought tamed. Isn't it time we learned our lesson? This new attack on the natural resource offered by phage clearly shows that we have not, by all means, searched for an active phage, but for our sakes, don't go spiking its guns. I found myself with a sense of deja vu as I recall my concerns when Bacillus thuringiensis products began to be used as pesticides, even though the live bacteria had long been used as a proper biological control. No patent fortunes to be made in that, of course. Using the natural process, bacteria multiply in target species and destroy it from within. Using bacterial products as sprays that don't multiply, the pest may or may not absorb a lethal dose, and resistance is much more likely to develop. Applying it via the GM route, post pests are still able to sample a leaf and reject it and go somewhere else. Not so if they had swallowed whole bacteria. No doubt resistance develops more slowly in insects than with the case of antibiotics and bacteria, but I think that the end result is inevitable. A useful living biocontrol has been rendered ineffective due to our obsession with finding the active ingredients of everything and using them pure. The same thinking was applied to the food industry when nutrition kicked off in the 19th century and gave us white bread and sugar from which we still have not recovered. While prospecting for antibiotics has been recently given a second chance through the new methods of cultivating bacteria in the wild, it seems clear that there is every intention of going on with business as usual, mass producing every find and then crashing in until resistance develops. Meanwhile, other countries have apparently been using the much more logical approach of letting whole phage target and destroy pathogenic bacteria all along. Why are the westernized countries not pursuing what would seem to be a much more likely way to combat drug resistance? The rather lame excuse seems to be that us fussy westernized people would not accept live viruses inside us, whereas we don't mind poisonous chemical drugs. I think willingness with which we shovel probiotic yogurts and even consider stool transplants demonstrates that it would not be so difficult to market phage as the next big natural medicine. In this case, it would really be medicine. Undoubtedly, phage therapies will have their own intrinsic problems getting around our immune defenses for one, but the fact of their quite long history of use shows that ways have been found. So what right do we, who have squandered all our magic bullets, have to start stripping down the medicinal phages used by other nations to their basic components in order to extract and squander the magic from them too? What we witness in the phage lysate paper discussed on TWIM is the start of an assault on the essential medicinal resources of other nations that could saddle them with pathogenic bacteria. In the, in the worst-case scenario, we might even upset the entire balance between phage and bacteria that has kept the latter under control for billions of years. I am, of course, only a lay observer in all of this, but it rather strikes me that playing loose and free with the essential tools and weapons with, with phages prevent our world from simply piling up with bacteria when we know that our own methods always result in resistance 
is a much more dodgy thing to contemplate than all those gain of function experiments we argue about. Yeah, here, here, here. These indeed could be called <laughs> loss of function experiments because used the way we know they will be used, they indirectly could result in reduction in effectiveness of some of the most vital housekeeping components of our ecosphere. I hope I'm wrong, but I think history is on my side. Steve is from England. Wow. He's thought about this quite Very a bit. Very provocative. Yes. Mm. Well, the thing well, is, is uh, go ahead, Michael. Go ahead. Well, he, the Georgians have basically been following his um, thesis statement. They effectively go out to their rivers and they isolate phage and they screen them against the organisms that are currently moving through their population because many phage lysogenize. And of course, just like the plasmid incompatibility groups, you get phage incompatibility groups. And so if you're a lysogen for a particular phage, that particular phage won't work against that particular infection. And so that's why the Georgians are always out to the sewage treatment plant, the rivers, literally collecting those resources that he's talking about so eloquently about going and, and effectively characterizing what's there. And they are keeping the microbes in check. They, you go through this period of lysogeny and then they effectively de the phage decamp out of the microbe and then they become sensitive again. And I think the principal reason they're going to this lysate approach is because they don't want to be constantly going back. So it's a labor issue as opposed to, I think, well, I guess it still goes back to profit. If, if it's, you have to pay somebody to go to the sewage treatment plant in the rivers to isolate the phage that are then active against the infections that are in your population. So you have to design custom drugs. Right. But there's some science motivating this also. Um, many pathogens are not accessible to, would not be accessible to whole phage. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Um, so we, we are fortunate to be able to um, engineer uh, soluble drugs that can reach all parts of our body, some better than others. But Could, we, could resistance emerge to this, the idea of that, um, the, the enzyme that gets into uh, cells and destroys what was it was yeah, it, a it was strep? a streptococcus it was a streptococcus do you think do you think you could do you think you could get resistance to that i mean i think resistance is always possible but how likely yeah i i wouldn't rule it out mm. for sure i don't know i don't know if that's a, way, a reason not to pursue something i think intact phages have their issues and that's why this is being pursued right 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 but i i'm not sure i would view it as taking away the efficacy of phages being used elsewhere because it's not it's not that widely used anyway right no, and it's principally the labor issue and you're constant, yeah, sure. constantly developing new materials. And then I think Steve also has an issue with antimicrobials, you know, purifying away from their natural products, but there's no other way to utilize them. You can't go get a fungus in, from the soil and treat people with that. You have to purify the, the antimicrobials from them, right? So right. there's just no way around that. So, um, but we do, but you know, the, 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 the fact of the matter is that we we try and do uh, what we think are the, the the most reasonable approaches to improve people's lives. Unfortunately, it has to be driven by profit because we are in a free market capitalist society, right? And that's the way things work. And there's no other way around it. We haven't. It's not the way we work. So that's the way we have to live with it. Although there is discussion now um, about whether it should be left to the private sector to decide whether or not to invest in new antimicrobials. Mm -hmm. Take, you mean and maybe taking it away yeah. from their, from their decision? Yeah. Well, that there should be more public investment. Yeah. That's not a bad idea. Right. Mm. Um, you know, it, it often drives what gets, you know, for vaccines, for viral vaccines, it gets, it drives what gets developed. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why we didn't have an Ebola vaccine for many years. And we still don't because, of profit issues and it's why we will have a Zika vaccine because many, many people will, will get it. And, we'll and, and it. the unintended consequences of the birth defects that adds a great cost to society. Of course, of course. The analogy that our, our CEO of ASM drew in his blog post, which I think is really brilliant is that um, lighthouses, mm -hmm. no shipping company, individual freighter would invest in building a lighthouse, that's even right. though it protects their ship. So that's something where there should be public investment to protect all comers. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. So then should the department of commerce be the ones funding this in addition to the national of institutes of health? <laughs> <laughs> I 
Well, certainly should be government funded. Yeah, yeah. And we need cooperation across borders, as we saw in the story um, from Michael, that yeah. this yeah. has probably um, emerged from farming practices in Southeast Asia. Yeah. Yep. All right. Um, we have one from Ben who writes, Dear Twimmers, I recently discovered your excellent podcasts. have been going back through your archives, discovering many gems. My favorites so far include the discussion about the bobtail squid with Margaret McFull Nye and Twim number 10. Quorum the, sensing. The, the, the number 10. Yeah. Yep, that's right. Quorum sensing. The discussions of E-Hux in Twim's 34 and 37 and the discussion of centenulid flatworms in Twim 21. I'm an artist and have no scientific training, so I listen without expecting to understand everything. But when things get a little too technical, I'm always sure that you will bring the discussion back around to a point that I can really understand. This is something I really appreciate. So thank you for your efforts to clearly communicate the intricacies of the fascinating and exciting world of microbial science. I recently came across this paper that I thought might be of interest. This is an example of a substance that is generating what seems to be a beneficial alteration of the gut microbiota. I found it particularly interesting that the species involved is Acromancia mucinophilia, one that regulates mucus in the gastrointestinal tract. Given that the mucosal lining of the intestine is an important area for communication between host and microbe, I wonder whether the ecology of the intestinal mucosa might be an interesting subject for a future twim. And he's Ben from Sydney who sent a paper called Prevention of Diet-Induced Obesity Effects on Body Weight and Gut Microbiota in Mice Treated Chronically with Delta-9 Tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, the active ingredient. Marijuana. Marijuana. That's right. Uh, chronic THC treatment reduced energy intake and prevented high fat diet induced increases in body weight. Yes. Well, you know, we're all in the end. I was thinking this the other day. We're all really ecologists in the end, aren't we? Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I did a, tw a TWIV last week at, at Penn State with a couple of people who study the virome of the oral cavity and the virome of coral. And we decided oh. that we are all holobionts. All of us are holobionts. <laughs> We're mixtures of cells and microbes and viruses, right? Yep. Well, Sounds about right. And the last is from, from Anthony, who sent us a paper, Experimental Evidence of a Symbiosis Between Red Cockaded Woodpeckers and Fungi. And this is uh, published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. It looks very cool. And this is, yes, and it shouldn't be surprising. There are all sorts of symbioses, uh, but mm -hmm. this involves a woodpecker, which is pretty cool. Uh, and fungi, symbiosis between cavity excavators and communities of fungi. This is so cool. And implications for forest ecology, wildlife management, and conservation. So we're all one world from big to small, and we all have to work together. That's the moral of this episode, right? <laughs> That's it. <laughs> and you can find Twim at iTunes. Uh, you can also find it at microbe.tv slash Twim and microbeworld.org. Uh, we, we do love hearing your questions and comments. Send them to Twim at microbe.tv. And do consider becoming a patron of Twim and all the other Microbe TV family of science shows. You can contribute as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash microbe TV. Oh, the proceeds uh, that we get from these ads and from uh, your patronage uh, will be used to get me some help to uh, process these shows. I would like to get a, a production assistant. I would like, because because I do everything, almost everything myself with these shows. I'd also like to be able to travel a little more and visit uh, laboratories with some of my colleagues. Like I could call up Michelle or Michael and say, hey, would you like to go to Hawaii tomorrow to uh, visit <laughs> a coral reef laboratory? And I'm sure they'd say yes, and we could do interesting shows from different places around the world. And so funds would help me do things like that. I just have a lot of ideas, and um, we're at the point now where we have limited resources. So it's all about making more cool science available to all of our listeners. And it is worth pointing out we do this as as volunteers. We do it as volunteers. So, so none of this exactly. is money for us. It's and I, for, and no, to support no, the show. I don't want money for from this personally. I wanted to enhance uh, our production. Michelle Swanson is at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah, and I I have to say, <laughs> go blue. 
because today is the opening of the Women's College World Series, Mm -hmm. and the Michigan softball team is out there going to make a run for another national championship. Nice. So, Are they home or is it away? No, it's out in um, Oklahoma City. The whole thing is out there in one place? And they're playing LSU later tonight. You get to watch it on TV? I will. Yeah, I think one of the ESPNs is carrying it. Nice. Well, yeah, good luck. Go blue. Yeah. Michael Schmidt is at the University, Medical University of South Carolina. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Michelle and Vincent. And I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM and Chris Kandian and Ray Ortega for their technical help. The music you hear on TWIM is composed and performed by Ronald Jenkins. You can find his work at ronaldjenkins.com. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology. 